Hey guys, welcome to another episode of COVID Convos where we have real conversations with real people about what wellbeing looks like in a pandemic. I'm really happy to be here. My name's Justin Griggs and uh, or Griggsy and I've got the, the crew with me and I'm looking forward to hearing about what they've seen that's maybe a bit weird or funky this week. Kesh, how are you? Hey man, I'm, I'm, I'm really good. Um, I'm a bit... I don't know if my weird thing is because it's not from this week, but I revisited it, and it was the the, the pon pon song. I don't know if you, anyone's ever heard about this, but it's a, a Japanese pop song, and it's absolutely classic. And if you want to watch something really weird, have a go. Just look up pon pon on YouTube. <laughs> Can you beat that, Simon? <laughs> <laughs> Can you spell that, Kish? Yeah, P O N P O N. P -O -N. Yeah. Um, you will not be disappointed. Trust me. Pon. Okay. No, I can't beat that one, Griggsy. Oh, maybe. Um, probably, I don't know, weird or interesting, but there was a shark attack here. Um, I think it was in the last week. Got a bit of attention. Um, but, yeah, it doesn't happen all the time. And a good reminder of, uh, yeah, that uh, when you put yourself out in that environment, you can get bitten by sharks. So, uh, very, very, um, very interesting, um, interesting one that, I guess there's other things in the world that can get you other than COVID. So yeah. uh, my interesting or weird thing was I've seen, uh, or I saw a couple uh, walking on the footpath in the opposite direction who walked into incoming, into incoming traffic rather than passing within three meters of us, even though the footpath was quite weird. <laughs> so uh, that's my weird thing. On that note, <laughs> Uh, I'd like to welcome our guest, April Crawford-Smith. Uh, April, how are you going? I'm pretty good, thanks, guys. Yeah, a little chilly, but good, good in general. Thank you. That's, uh, that's good to hear, April. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I've actually got the, the singlet on because uh, it's getting nice weather over here and we're just about to come home. So not very pleased to be uh, reminded of that cold weather. <laughs> but um, April, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind um, introducing yourself uh, to to us and to the to the listeners. Sure. Well, um, I'm April, and um, I live in the Hawkesbury, uh, outside of Sydney. I was born in Katoomba on Gunungurra land, and now live in the Hawkesbury on Darug land, um, on a beautiful one acre property. And I can see the trees and the birds, and they're making a brilliant racket at the moment because it's sunset it's really incredible listening to them I had to close all the windows because I thought they might be a bit noisy um, and um, I work for the Valley Center which is building sustainable communities um, with Aboriginal communities around the country um, I work with Kesh doing warm data with the Bateson Institute and a lot of amazing other folks around the world um, and also run a, a little organization called Pingala, um, which is a community energy um, cooperative building solar farms in Sydney. So yeah, there's a couple of little, little things about me. I also love meditation and bushwalking and painting and writing and yeah, lots of other fun things. So a little bit of an intro there. April, that's quite a, uh, quite a broad, uh, I guess, area of interest and, and work. Um, we spoke a little bit before the show and you mentioned community energy. I'm, I'm interested to, to hear a little bit about what that is. Um, mm. Would you mind giving us a bit of a, a bit of an outline? Yeah, for sure. Um, so community energy is this concept that was um, conceived in Europe where, um, and America where communities are coming together and, and owning and operating their own um, energy projects. Um, and for, for a lot of European countries, it's really normal. Um, where you'll have a run of river owned by the local people or a solar farm that's run by a bunch of community members. And the concept started here about um, seven or eight years ago. We, we really didn't know in Australia what that meant. And um, soon after that, Pingala was formed. And Pingala means solar in Sanskrit. Well, Pingala actually is the right way to say it, but we, we call ourselves Pingala. And so we bring communities together and install solar on rooftops. Um, communities provide the capital to install the solar and they receive a dividend from from their investment 
uh, over time. But there's many, many different ways that lots of uh, places are doing this. And it's, um, yeah, it's a worldwide concept and, and we're one of the many, many groups that are um, taking back a bit of control over our energy system and, and making it fairer and more accessible, greener and um, localised. So, yeah, it's a bit of a rundown. <laughs> And, and what motivated you to get uh, involved in, in this, April? Was there something, uh, I guess, something in your, in your own life or was it just something you stumbled into? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of both. I mean, I'm not one to sort of design or plan my life. I'm definitely adverse to that kind of thinking. I much prefer to go where, where the journey takes me. Um, so I did kind of fall into it, but it, it wasn't really by accident. You know, in looking back, my dad... Um, did a lot of renewable energy engineering when, when he was alive and proponent of lots of different um, green projects, you know, making fuel out of chicken poo and, and tidal energy and all that sort of stuff. Um, after working in coal and, and all the polluting industries, um, realizing that this wasn't the way to go and, and starting his own business, um, must be back in the early eighties. Um, so yeah, it wasn't a direct thing, but there was definitely a beautiful influence from my family and, um, their early activism and environmentalism for sure as well. Yeah. Um, and April, I'm just wondering how um, you said you mentioned that um, it's been going on for seven or eight years. So obviously um, a lot of history before the current pandemic, but how have things changed over the last few months with everything that's been going on? Mm, yeah, well, it's, it's a really um, interesting question and, because for me, it was such a surprise. At the start, you know, sort of February, March, there was a lot of internal shock and how are we going to cope with this? Um, we've been for the last um, many years, all volunteer run. So all of, all of our people are um, mums and dads or young people at university, um, young professionals um, coming together to, to build this vision. And so um, we lost basically 90% of our capacity in terms of our volunteer base. Um, but we've also turned an interesting corner in that we've been able to employ ourselves at the same time because of historic work and grants becoming available and that sort of stuff. So it's really an interesting thing that a lot of our base had to fall away because, you know, parents with young kids working full time then just have nothing, no other space, you know, no other emotional, physical, mental space. Um, with the pandemic um, and and we thought that you know people wouldn't be able to invest or even think about doing something outside of the day-to-day -day survival um, we thought our upcoming projects would all be halted um, for at least maybe six months um, but amazingly enough it's been the exact opposite and it's it's just so incredible it's such a testament to um, the groundswell of support towards things that are community sustaining, that are bringing vitality, that are making um, exciting things more accessible to everyday people. Um, we sent a call out to our supporters and it's only about a thousand people. Um, and we got a response back within an hour for a hundred people saying, yes, they would like to invest in something if there was an opportunity. And we're currently working with four or five um, sites at the moment who are really keen to, to develop a project. And it's just, yeah, it's just really blowing me away that, that people um, have the capacity and the time to, to put to something that is completely outside of that everyday sphere of survival. And just, yeah, it's so humbling and exciting that, it's, um, that those possibilities are still real for us. Yeah, that, that sounds great. And, and it is different to what I thought might've been the situation. I thought, <clears throat> you know, you, you could have likely said that everything's sort of gone downhill and dried up, but that's great to hear. Um, mm. I wonder whether, and you mentioned this when you introduced yourself about taking back a bit of control about um, where people get their power from. I wonder whether that's at play here as well. In, and we've heard about it or discussed it with other guests on the show that um, right. in this you know time of great uncertainty, people are looking for things they can do that, that give them that sense of control. So um, yeah, maybe that's even more relevant now um, in what you mm. guys are doing. Mm. Yeah, I've definitely seen that in the food, um, growing their own food and getting, you know, having to cook everything rather than going out to restaurants and cafes because they're all closed. And yeah, I mean, it could easily be an extension of that to, to energy, to electricity. Um, there always has been a, a quite a good groundswell of support for renewable energy and 
um, you know, people installing solar on their own homes and looking at batteries and things. But yeah, I think you're right that people are going, hang on, we, we can no longer be waiting for somebody else to do this because you, you, you flick one switch and all of our support systems are gone. What do we do? And so we need to start building them for ourselves. Mm. Um, and yeah. April, what does, what does this look like on the ground? Because I'm, I mean, I've, I've had no experience whatsoever in this, in this sort of area. So I'm just interested, you know, I'm getting a bit of a picture with, you know, you're saying a thousand people and uh, what, what does it actually look like? What sort of stuff uh, do, you, do you guys do to, to, um, I know you said like, it's obviously renewable and, and trying to take it away from, I'm guessing from government um, supplied energy. Uh, is it is it just one particular sort of energy in solar, or is it is it more broad than that? For us, it's just solar, um, Grigsy, because we're in Sydney, so it's really urban. So the the potential for wind or um, other other big scale projects aren't really an option unless we went into oceanic energy, which um, at the moment for us is just out of scope. Um, but certainly, other groups and other companies, other community organisations are doing all sorts of different renewable energy projects. Um, but in terms of what it looks like on the ground, so um, our first project was with a brewery in Newtown. And um, so they wanted to go solar and they're really keen to do the environmental piece. But then they heard about us through one of their beer drinkers and, and they said, oh, this sounds cool. You know, we're really focused on our community and serving the people. That's their tagline. Um, they do so many events and do heaps of free stuff and they're just generally awesome guys. Um, and so when they heard that uh, their solar system could be actually invested in by their people, um, they just thought that was so fantastic. So we had a big party and told everyone to come and we had Clover Moore doing a keynote and other amazing speakers and we had about 300 people there in, in the brewery in Newtown. Um, and had a beer barrel, put all the names of, of, of the people who wanted to invest in the beer barrel and we drew them out and those people were invited to invest the day later. And then um, there was a couple of weeks of capital raising. So once their name was drawn out, they um, issued shares in the cooperative um, and we used that money to then install the solar, which was, yeah, very quickly after that. And the site, Young Henry's pays us a, um, a small lease payment for the, for the use of the panels, which is the same amount as the energy generated. Um, and we use that money to send it back to the investors, um, who are the people of Newtown, you know, so it's, it's, um, super local. We had lots of, um, local guys doing the jobs and, um, yeah, amazing food cooked by people from the area, you know, just, it was just such a wonderful day and we've got a beautiful video that the Guardian made of it and yeah, I don't know. What else did you want me to say? <laughs> no, no, that's that's fantastic. Thank you. I mean, it always fascinates me that I mean, I'm over in Belgium at the moment, which has, mm. I mean, such compared to Australia, it's a massive difference in the sun sunlight that they get. It's really only a couple of months a year. So I'm always confused by why there's so many solar panels over here, <laughs> and there's just just I mean, in Australia, comparatively, it's there's just not the same same uh, sort of interest. So I don't know if you've got the answer to that or whether it's just something that, that yeah, a, a mystery that, <laughs> that, that I'm, well, it's definitely, I'm, I'm in, incapable of understanding it. So, uh, yeah. and if any other guys um, have any ideas, let me know. It's definitely linked to um, government driving yeah. it. Yeah. Euro European governments are incredible at just driving policy. Australia is very, very behind. So a lot of the citizen base have had to stand up and, and do it themselves, which, which in a way has been really fantastic because if it was all government led and government driven, there'll be a lot less community building and community capacity in that process. Whereas because they've taken a back seat for decades, um, it's meant that people have had to come together to do it themselves. And I think when considering that history now with COVID, we're all ready, we're all here, we're all, the community is built, people are ready to come together, that thirst and that desire for, for connection, um, e even though it's mostly online, is, is still, it's so critical. Um, and without that, without that years and years of building that community, I don't know how we would respond, you know, how, how would we support each other if, if that community infrastructure, in terms of the connections, um, wasn't there. So it's, it's kind of an amazing, yeah result considering 
Yeah, April. Um, just amazing, amazing work. I really love things like this where people are, you know, tackling the system, right? Like, um, I'm really curious because you've been able, I'm just really interested in this, um, I guess, your ability or the community's ability to keep this going despite everything that's happening. Like, you know, we've had a stall on our economy, right? Money is scarce. People are sort of being pulled back from their jobs. But there's still obviously energy, quote unquote, um, yeah. energy here for these particular projects. And it's because you've done that work to build it up. And I'm really curious, what do you think have been the success ingredients in making this happen? Like in getting it to this point and, you know, what are people getting out of it from your side that you see? Is it just about the energy? Is it just about taking back that power or is there more to it? Yeah, it's a great question, Kesh. I think, I think a, a, a big part of it is that control, as Simon was saying earlier. Um, the energy system in Australia is, is, is monopolized by, by a couple of big companies and, and by a government um, network operator. Um, in terms of the retailing and and then when you look at big solar and big wind it's all big companies as well and so who are the who are the people behind those projects who are the people that are actually on the ground you know putting the solar panels and the stakes in the ground um, and so community energy makes those things visible and instead of shareholders in a distant country or a distant part of the world receiving um, those returns each year as in the conventional stock market, the, the dividends are coming straight back to the community where the solar is being installed or the wind project is being installed. So my, um, one of my co-founders, Tom, talks about this, this thing called the leaky bucket syndrome where you have a bucket of, bucket of water and you've got holes in the bottom and all the, all, the, all the parts are leaking and leaking in terms of jobs, leaking in terms of money. I mean, the amount of money we pay to retailers as homes, as businesses, and who are those retailers, these giant companies? That, that market is becoming a lot more, um, a lot less um, oligopoly and more like, you know, much more companies coming into the scene, but still it's, it's highly controlled. Um, and so taking back that power is um, incredible in a tangible sense, but then also in, in how you feel. You know, um, interviewing people about this when they when they get to buy a share, and and by the way, our our, our share packets are two hundred and fifty dollars, so that that's it's it's the smallest amount of community investment in Australia. We've made it really really accessible, so young families or students or people with a tiny bit of extra cash, including myself, I can't put in a lot of money, um, making it accessible for them. Hearing hearing how excited they are, how how they feel like they're a part of something bigger that they can't do themselves. A lot of people rent in Sydney. I mean, it's like anywhere else in major cities. You, you, you're not living in your own home necessarily, or you're living in, a, in an apartment building that's controlled by strata. So how do you do your own solar? How do you, how do you get amongst it? Um, and Australia is really, really is moving forward, despite what I said about government um, not driving it. We are, we, are going, we are going far. We have the highest um, uh, solar home ownership per capita and anywhere in the world so it's so there are some really really good success stories um but those people who can't do it how do, how do they get involved how do they get amongst this how do they benefit from it how do they see it happen well community energy provides that way for people to to put their money where their mouth is but then also benefit um and it's just you know i can send you some some videos you just see the excitement in people i i can't even really quantify i can't even really describe what it is you know but it's just this just this um, enthusiasm, <laughs> um, but also the other ingredients, just, just quickly, the other ingredients for success, Kesh, I just think how real we are, you know, we're not, we're not trying to be any, anything else other than a community, community led, community driven organization, um, serving the people, serving the community. Um, we're not trying to be super professional because that's old system. We're just, we're just real people doing it with each other. And that's people really gravitate towards that. You know, they really feel that power of, yeah, just being real with each other. April, I was going to ask, is, is it because it's uh, such a local focus, is it actually possible for, for people beyond the community to invest? So, for example, if I, you know, I'm in Victoria or normally in Victoria, uh, would I be able to invest? Yeah, you can. So our cooperative is a national, um, it operates under national law. 
So technically we can have investors from anywhere in Australia. Um, but we, we like to prioritise the people who live right near the site or at least within in the same city. So with Young Henry's, I think it was 90% of the people that lived in Newtown and, and more in Marrickville and those sorts of areas. But we definitely had investors from other states. So, yeah. April, I'm really curious if um, this work is reconnecting people back to land in a way that, you know, we've lost in so many other ways. I mean, like, in, in essence, when we think about, like, I guess, connection to land, land is where you get your energy from. Like, and that's, you know, that, that was food and um, water and all of that other kind of stuff um, yeah. back in the day. But in a way, now that that's been removed, made invisible, um, controlled by other people, and it's sort of like, it kind of comes to us in a civil pattern, we have no idea where it came from. Is, is that something that you've been noticing? Is this like, um, I don't know, I see massive potential there. Mm. Yeah, definitely. The connection to something local is is really, really powerful. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say connection to the land because in Sydney it's so urbanised, but definitely connection to a place um, and relocalization and um, decentralization. You know, so many of our um, facets of our economy are centralised and energy is, is one of the biggest. And I, I don't know who decided to, to build poles and wires all over the country. We have the, the biggest national energy market in, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, the, the NEM. Mm. And every time I drive down the road, all I see is power lines on the side. And I think, why? Why did we do this? Who decided to do this? Why don't we have a, plant, a, a solar plant or a, a whatever plant right here? And that, that powers this neighborhood and it powers that neighborhood and another one down the road. So this decentralization is is part of the whole picture and that i think is what is drawing us back to connection to place and land yeah for sure Kesh, i find that such an interesting point uh the idea of i guess going away from um local to to, to bigger and then that movement back to to like the central or the like do it yourself sort of thing i think we are starting to see that you know and um like for example, it's I see it in the food, sort of um, you know homegrown veggies and that sort of thing, and the pleasure that that gives to people over, even though it's much harder and and a lot more work and potentially financially not even any better to do uh, do the the growing yourself. I'm just wondering where this relates to, I guess, well-being science. What 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 does that? What is that? When that you, you get that feeling of self-sufficiency. Is it a feeling of autonomy? Um, and this is probably a question more directed, uh, sorry, April, but at, at the co-host, but if you've got something, feel free to jump in. Mm. Well, you know, the, the things that have been going through my head as April has been talking are, you know, yes, autonomy, but also a lot of eudaimonic well-being, um, a lot of connection type stuff. And actually something that um, I think gets left out of you, well-being science a lot, that we've been trying to bring in more and more, which is connection to environment. Like it's a lot of our, you know, well-being science comes from Western models of science and they focus primarily on biological, social, emotional um, types of indicators of well-being. Um, and one of the things that's been left out a lot because we focus so much on the individual is environment. And it's amazing that, you know, something like April's been doing which is simply taking something that's ours and bringing it back to, to, to us, um, connecting us back to our environment in a way that is place-based, can create that eudaimonic well-being for people in a way, like, I can't wait to see those videos because um, <laughs> seeing those examples will really drive it home. But like, even you, Greasy, I can imagine like feeling the same as me right now, really excited about this idea and the potential for it. I think, you know, people feel that there's something in that that speaks to us as human beings. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about the different examples that I can think of where people feel that, like that self-satisfaction from doing something or owning something versus it being outsourced. Mm. And I was even thinking of, you know, quite a few uh, people, completely different to what we're talking about here, but quite a few people that I know have been sending through photos or videos of them making their own decks or, um, <laughs> you know, building projects just different things like that, that because they've had obviously the excess or excess time, but I guess they're at their home um, all the time. 
it's it's quite an interesting uh i guess question to pose right now is is that that whole idea of you know what 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 do you want what do you want in terms of like what do you want to create yourself and what are you willing to outsource because i think that's that's a that's something that we need to be asking ourselves do we want to outsource our childcare? do we want to outsource um our building our energy um and i think that's that's probably a question that we we've just slowly it, it's, it's seeped into things being outsourced over time and now we've got methods and technologies that maybe can allow us to to bring it back and um yeah, i'm interested to get involved april what, what can, can you give us give us more information about investing here <laughs> yeah for sure i mean i can't tell you exactly which project but we've got one opening really soon actually which is amazing and then probably a few more after that um but i just want to really quickly speak to what you were saying Rigsy, because for me self-sufficiency is a satisfaction thing um and something i just live for but also We've had so many of our essential services cut over the last little while. I've been smashed by fires. You know, we had, we had fires surrounding our properties. We had no electricity. We had no running water. Um, and so at what point do we start to do those things for ourselves? Because looming crisis really highlights how reliant we are on somebody else doing it for us. And so it's not just that it's really awesome. It feels good, but it's actually completely necessary. And so, that's that's my whole work with the valley center working with aboriginal communities that's their vision too to have it done for themselves self-determination autonomy not only for um getting rid of colonialism but a cultural sense of um, ownership over their own livelihoods and it's really really powerful and, and kesh mentioned food and water as well and housing and everything and that's what we're doing with the valley center um but yeah, for sure, Pingala, you can sign up to our mailing list and you can like us on Facebook, you know, all that general stuff. And that's, that's where we talk about our new project. So yeah, she is. <laughs> awesome, April. That's like, I've really enjoyed um, chatting about this and it's, it's something that I'm interested to learn more about. I'm obviously from my questions, I'm obviously still quite ignorant about it and I'm happy to admit that, but uh, it's something that I'd, I'd like to learn about. So um, thanks for introducing it to us and, and to our listeners. And um, and uh, I guess uh, my last question is: Is there anything that, that we haven't spoken about yet that you'd uh, you'd like to share with guests that maybe we haven't had the opportunity to touch on? I was reflecting on this the other day. This goes to a much more personal level. Um, talking to my partner about the impact of COVID on us personally and our families, and the thing that I've noticed is that um, people who are finding things a little bit easier are those with um, a daily practice, whether it be exercise or meditation or mindfulness, um, something that gives them that sense of stepping back from the intensity of the pandemic and gives their body some time to chill and regenerate. Um, that's the one thing that I've seen and, and um, it's, it's, yeah, it's just an amazing contrast. Um, and so I'd encourage anybody to, to have a look at those things. I know we haven't talked about that at all, but it just is so much in my heart, you know, going out to people who are, there's a lot of suffering and it causes me a lot of pain, not only in my close networks, but in, yeah, in, in friends and other family of their friends and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, just speaking to that really close, just a little bit at the end. Thanks. Well, thanks so much, April. It's, it's been great to, to reflect on self-sufficiency. I guess uh, I've really struggled to actually, explain what my my thoughts are and and even ask questions here so uh but it's been a pleasure to have you on the show uh i'm just aware that i seem to be losing dropping out occasionally so i'm hoping that my voice is is coming across okay to you guys but um i just wanted to make sure you heard me april thank you so much uh for joining us and um we wish you and uh, your family all the best uh, throughout this uh this interesting time in our in our planet's uh evolution thanks guys well, thank you so much uh, for, to everyone for joining us. We really appreciate you, uh, you tuning in. And as usual, we request that if you could, if you're interested, you like, share and subscribe. And in the meantime, stay healthy, world. Mm -hmm.